Well, I hope you're going to enjoy this video about the ARC-5 transmitter. This is my favorite transmitter. It's a surplus beauty. We're going to go through this thing top to bottom, see what we need to do to restore it, to get it back on the air. There's a lot of these out there on the uh, on the internet for sale on eBay at Hamfests. They're in all different shapes. Some are drilled up. Some have holes through them. Some are missing parts. We're going to go through the whole thing and see what it takes to put one of these babies on the air. Known as the Command Set or the ARC-5. Uh, the ARC-5 of course was the T-series of the transmitters. Um, this is uh, a T-19 which covers uh, 3 to 4 megahertz. And then the other series is called the 274N. The 274N uh, uh, being the uh, the Army version uh, was uh, BC nomenclature. Like the uh, 80 meter was known as the BC 696. This is a BC 696. Um, either uh, of these may be painted, but generally the Army versions, the 274s, are uh, without paint. And the Navy versions are typically painted with a black uh, crackle finish. Uh, these transmitters were used for everything uh, once they were made surplus uh, after World War II. They were readily available on the surplus market. As a matter of fact, so many of them uh, existed as surplus that uh, uh, they were uh, plentiful even up through the 70s and even the 80s. In fact, I have a, a catalog here. It's a 1983 fair radio sales catalog. And the, uh, they've still got two two ARC 5s listed. It says here command transmitters with proper use can put out 50 watts CW and 30 watts phone. And uh, they have a BC 650, uh, a BC 457, which is a T20, and a BC 458, which is a T21. So they don't tell you which one they're going to send you, but they do say that they have uh, a 4 to 5.3 megahertz and a 5.3 to 7 megahertz in there, 1995 each. So that was in the 1983. And I, I picked up my first uh, ARC-5 transmitter in 1973 and uh, used it as my novice transmitter. Now, I was inspired to use it as a novice transmitter because uh, the actual amateur radio handbook, the ARRL's uh, radio amateur handbook, listed the ARC-5 uh, and it says converting surplus transmitters for novice use. This article was carried in the handbook up through 1967. So from the late 40s through 1967 these transmitters were considered uh, usable on the on the amateur bands especially as a novice transmitter. Uh, the VFO stability on these transmitters is legendary. In fact it's the basis for many of the early single sideband and double sideband transmitters. Uh, hams were just not able to build VFOs of this quality, especially when you could pick one up for a few dollars. There was no need to try to construct a VFO when you could uh, buy one. Um, this is a 73 magazine from 1966, and the ARC-5s are, are all over it, really. Uh, here's Columbia out of uh, Los Angeles. They're listing uh, command transmitters for $9.95 each, and the the ones that are not in the ham bands are listed for $5.95 each. And the modulator is listed for $6.95. That's an MD7 modulator that was included the dynamotor. So at those prices, uh, uh, it was much cheaper just to buy one of these and use it as the basis for your transmitter. A lot of people also use them to drive larger tubes like a single 813 making a couple hundred watt transmitter with this as the basis of the driving section or the exciter. Another thing that got people very excited about the command sets was a series of uh, surplus radio conversion manuals that came out in the late 40s. This one is volume number one 1948 and it already is talking about the transmitter for use as a VFO. In other words, using it strictly as a VFO because of its stability, um, these transmitters were recognized as state-of-the-art uh, right after the war. So there's some excellent uh, 
excellent articles on these transmitters and you may want to try to check out some of these references I'm going to give you right now. Uh, first of all, uh, you want to get a hold of the, uh, the handbook and maintenance instructions for the AN ARC-5. Um, it's AN08-10-195. Um, as well as the AN 16-30 ARC-5-2 Handbook of Maintenance Instructions for the AN ARC-5. You want to get a hold of these Instruction for Operation Maintenance of Radio Set SCR 274N 1943. You can find them on the internet if you search a little bit or you can buy them uh, from uh, reprinters and a lot of times you can find them surplus uh, as manuals right on eBay. Lots of great articles, probably hundreds of articles were written about the transmitters. 1957 ARRL, Converting Surplus Transmitters for Novice Use. Stinson, uh, AB5S, has a great article called uh, Getting Your ARC-5 Running Without Hacking It Up. And that's another thing we're going to go over. As you find these now, generally they're going to have all kinds of holes, missing parts, modifications, etc. And we're going to go through all of that with the transmitter and figure out how to put it on the air or to restore it. CQ, November 1964, uh, article by Gordon White, The Command Set Story. Gordon White, uh, Command Sets, CQ, October 1965. Walt Hutchins, An Electric Radio. An Electric Radio has several excellent articles on the ARC 5s and the uh, 274s. Uh, Electric Radio and Uniform, Command Sets, Part 1, uh, March 1990. Electric Radio and Uniform, Command Sets, Part 2, April 1990. Uh, Jim Hanlon, on the air with command set triplets, June 1995, electric radio. And uh, there's a follow-up to that, July 1995. I myself wrote an article on the uh, command set in the July 2008 issue of electric radio. Um, and also a follow-up in August that goes over the uh, complete uh, conversion of the set for use on the air. It's called Secrets of the Dead Command Sets, Part 1 and 2. So you want to get your hands on these electric radios. They're going to be very collectible in the future. Okay, first of all, we don't have a B-17 or a B-29, so we're not really going to be able to uh, use the transmitter as it was intended in an aircraft. We're going to try to use it on the ham bands. But that doesn't mean we have to completely destroy the transmitter. We can use it pretty much as it was intended to be used by the uh, Army Air Force and the Navy in World War II. The transmitter itself is uh, a throwback to the 1930s. It's a master oscillator power amplifier type transmitter. That is, it has a variable frequency oscillator that directly drives the power amplifier tubes. The oscillator, in the case of the ARC-5, is the 1626 power triode. It's operated in a Hartley type oscillator, a, a power oscillator running at about 5 watts input power, and in itself it puts out about 2 watts of power. That drives a pair of tubes called 1625s. 1625s are basically a 12 volt version of the 807 which was the workhorse, workhorse tube of the 1930s in many uh, commercial and ham radio transmitters. The reason that they chose a 12 volt tube is they could put two of these filaments in series and it would add up to the 24 to 28 volts found on aircraft. So the first thing we need to know is how rare are these tubes? It turns out that they were made by their hundreds of thousands by the various tube manufacturers in the United States including uh, RCA, Hytron, uh, Raytheon, uh, to name a few, Sylvania, many many manufacturers of these tubes and at ham flea markets today you can pick them up for around 75 cents each to this day. Um, even on eBay uh, you will find them occasionally as low as two or three dollars each. So these tubes are not rare tubes um, they were manufactured in such high quantities that I think we're going to have them well into the future. That said, uh, they don't last forever. Some of them have low emission. Some of the oscillator tubes with low emission will exhibit a lot of chirp when keyed in CW. And some of the power amplifier tubes will lose emission and power over time. 
So uh, let's look at the, a couple of the, uh, the schematics of the, of the two types of sets. Uh, first, let's talk about the 274N series. This is the BC457, BC696 series. Let's take a look at the schematic. Um, we start over here with the 1626 power oscillator, which is a Hartley oscillator. There is a crystal oscillator calibrator. It's a magic eye tube, a 1629 magic eye tube. And this magic eye tube uh, gives a single calibration point on the dial. So when you hit that point, the eye will open up like this. Then we have the two power amplifier tubes in parallel. And there is neutralization called Rice neutralization. And there is a, a neutralizing capacitor. We then go into the output tank, and there's an antenna tuning system and some relays. The antenna used on the aircraft was very short and very capacitive. Therefore, there is a series roller inductor that's used to tune out the capacitance of that trailing wire antenna, which allowed the transmitter to be efficient. So I've now removed the uh, magic eye tube as well as the calibration crystal. This calibration crystal is 3265, 3.265 megahertz. And this is the magic eye tube, the 1629. So this gives you a single calibration point on your dial that it gives you a confidence that the set is in good calibration before you uh, take off in the plane. Uh, while interesting, these are not absolutely essential for ham use, as uh, you can use a frequency counter or some other means to tell what exact frequency you're on. You don't need to use this calibration set point. But it does work very well, and uh, when you find them in a set, it's always a bonus. When you have to hunt for them, sometimes it's hard to find these parts. I've removed the top lid of the, uh, of the ARC-5 T19. Um, it has a couple of uh, what appear to be uh, trap doors. These allow you to be able to remove the tubes and service the set. And notice there's a mirror here. This mirror allows you to read the magic eye tube from the front of the transmitter. It's a clever uh, sort of periscope arrangement. It allows you to, to see the magic eye tube from the front of the transmitter. There's also a Caution high voltage stop dynamotor before removing this cover. This is the cover over the two 1625 power amplifier tubes. If you were to touch those plate caps while transmitting, you would not only be subject to the high voltage of 5 to 600 volts, but also you would get a nasty RF burn, which uh, would certainly wake you up. Uh, the last uh, feature is this. Uh, Adjustment on the top allows you access to uh, touch up your calibration using that crystal calibrator that we mentioned before. We stick a screwdriver in there and we can uh, get the set point exact according to the crystal. So that's the top cover. Notice it's lightweight aluminum. Uh, louvers for uh, ventilation. Very simple, very light construction. Characteristic of uh, high quality uh, lightweight American construction in World War II.